Here's Mercy. Here's Mercy. Here's Mercy. Here's Mercy. Here's Mercy. Here's Mercy. Good start. <laughs> Thank you. You're a beautiful crowd, wonderful crowd. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm all right now, but last week, last week was rough. Last week, I finally submitted my final draft of my thesis to my supervisor, waited a week. He sent it back, said that's a great start. I can't wait to see the rest of it. <laughs> I tell you, it's always the same, always the same. Last week again, I installed a brand new smart save feature on my, uh, whatever it is I'm writing my thesis on. It's supposed to save. Every time you put down something new and like noteworthy and relevant to your thesis, it'll save it automatically. I wrote 30 pages, the damn thing didn't sell once. <laughs> uh, hi everybody, my name is Pierce Murphy. Uh, I am a final year PhD student in the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And if nobody knows what that is, that's fine, because nobody does know what that is. <laughs> DIAS, as I like to call it, it's a, it's a research institute. So basically it's a place where people go and think really hard about stuff that nobody really cares about. <laughs> No, that's disingenuous. It's a research centre for people who are trying to get to the fundamentals of what the universe is all about. We have people studying the formations of stars, who are looking at the interactions between the solar wind and the planets, the outer planets and Jupiter, their magnetospheres. There's people who are, like me, looking at the sun, just going outside and staring at the sun all day. <laughs> um, and you might be imagining, oh, a research institute, that sounds really cool, really fancy. It's not. It's one of those old, terrible Georgian buildings on Leeson Street or wherever, um, where they've terribly converted into an office. Uh, genuinely, the day we moved in, they told us that you can't have more than three people in this office or the floor may collapse. <laughs> so I have been, every day now, coming up to the end of the PhD, I've been slowly going up the stairs until I finally get to the last one and <laughs> hoping to God it will collapse around me and I won't have to finish this bloody PhD. <laughs> Um, I am a PhD student, as I said, numerous times. I'm looking at the sun. I just go outside and stare at the sun. I don't do that. I look at the sun with a telescope called LOFAR, the Low Frequency Array. And LOFAR is a different telescope to what you might think. So usually telescope, pirate, looking at the uh, lens or whatever. But there are actually more, there's more to light than light, than you might imagine. So light as we see it, it's whatever. X-rays, they're a type of light. UV, that's a type of light. Infrared is a type of light. Radio is a type of light, uh, and I look at the radio sun, which is totally different to everything, and I use um, this telescope called LOFAR. Now, radio telescopes are different, again, to what you might imagine a telescope to be. Uh, some of you might have an idea in your head, one big, huge dish with loads of steel supporting it up so it can point out to the universe, or in China there's a mountain that has been cut apart and a radio telescope placed into it. LOFAR is nothing like these. LOFAR, if you want to imagine it, is 96 pipes, PVC pipes, about that tall, sticking out of the ground. <laughs> it's as simple as that. There's the pipe and they've cut cold wires coming out. And the reason it's like this, it's so simple, is because the idea with LOFAR is you want a load of them. You don't want one big fancy telescope, you want a load of smaller, crapper, shitter telescopes. <laughs> but they are actually really good. In fact, Ireland is the proud owner of a LOFAR telescope. There are 53 all across Europe. We have one in Burr, in County Offaly, put together by myself and about 20 other undergrad students. And as you can imagine, anything done by myself and 20 other undergrad students was fueled by uh, lots of Guinness, lots of hangovers. <laughs> but it still works, and that's great. <laughs> The best part about LOFAR is you can use all these different telescopes all across Europe, one in Ireland, there's all in the Netherlands, loads in the Netherlands, they love the stuff. Um, but all over Europe, you can add all the signals of them together. This is the great thing about radio science and radio astronomy. You can take loads and loads of different telescopes and add them all together. Because through the power and magic of math, if you have a radio telescope here and a radio telescope over here, you essentially have one radio telescope that's the entire size of the entire stage. And that's really good, because the bigger the thing you have is, the better you can actually see. Like, it's like pixel or phone resolution, or camera resolution even, with radio telescopes. It's really, really important. So when you have a huge load of stuff all together, you um, get to see stuff really well, really far away stuff really better, really better. English is not my first. <laughs> <laughs> But I use this to look at the sun, and why do I look at the sun? So the sun is the most amazing thing in the whole solar system. Anybody who says otherwise is a liar, and they should be getting rid of. Um, the sun, there's so much stuff going on in the sun. We have huge releases of energy, solar flares, coronal mass ejections, just like 
bursts of energy that can wipe out life on this planet as we know it, if we're lucky. And <laughs> all, all of this sort of stuff. But not only is there all of that, there's also radio bursts from the sun. So light, or radio is a type of light. We'll see flashes of light from the sun, of this radio light, not associated with any of these huge, massive, earth-ending, catastrophic events. And that's what I do. I look at these things, and I want to know why do, well, why do these happen? What do they look like? All of this stuff. Because the thing with the sun is, it's a great, like, it's, a, it's not a secret, it's a well-known within the field, but probably people outside don't know. Solar physicists don't know why the sun is hot. <laughs> Genuinely do not know why the sun is hot. <laughs> the middle makes sense. When you're in the middle, you have like loads of hydrogen and atoms smashing into each other, releasing energy. That's hot. That's fine. And as it goes out, everything works as normal. You, you're hot in the middle. You move away. It gets colder. And then you go up and up and up and up to the atmosphere where you think, OK, we're in the atmosphere now. It's going to get colder and colder and colder until we're in the blank, desolate nature of space. But that doesn't happen. It, in fact, gets hotter and hotter and hotter very, very, very quickly. Over the space of about 200 kilometers, the temperature raises by like 10 or 1 million degrees Kelvin. Kelvin, which is, may as well be Celsius at that number. It just gets really hot. Nobody knows why. So <laughs> we want to look at the sun, and we want to see these radio flashes. Because, hey, something's going on there. That means there's energy or something, right? And if there's energy, there must be heat. So there must be that heat's going in there. You're, you're putting that in there. I want to know what's going on. <laughs> And it's the same with anybody doing anything weird and obscure on the sun. It's basically, where's that energy coming from? I want it. <laughs> so I look at these, and I look at it with LOFAR, as I said. And it's a LOFAR, it's a telescope powered by math. <laughs> it's Halloween, it's spooky. <laughs> but the problem with the telescope powered by math <laughs> is that it's not the same as taking a photo with the... Uh, camera or a regular telescope. There's something funky going on, and the result is that all the photo or all the images of the sun and radio just look the same and shit. They look like big blobs, just big radio blobs, because that's just how radio telescopes work. They're not all that great, as it turns out. <laughs> uh, don't tell any funding agencies that. Specifically, not <laughs> the SFI, <laughs> who fund Lofer and are a great bunch of people, I'm sure. <laughs> The thing is, though, we actually learn a lot from the blobs. How blobby the blobs are is actually the most important thing in the world, because I've spent the last four years of my life trying to tell myself that that's the most important thing in the world. The reason is, when you have a radio burst, it goes off, whatever. We actually think they don't look like blobs. We think they should be really, really small points of light. But when we see a blob, that means something's happening to the light. And for something to happen to the light, there's energy. And as all solar physicists want to know, where's the energy? I want it. <laughs> So me looking at these, it's like, okay, this is blobby in this way, and then I just, look at, I just look at loads. I look at loads of blobs, and I say, that one's that big, that one's that big, and you look at how big they are over how close they are to the center, and you get a peak, and it's like, now I have a PhD, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> no, I, actually, I haven't actually submitted anything just yet. That was a joke. It's a comedy set. Uh, <laughs> but I'm due to submit on December 15th. Uh, which is great because coincidentally the rickety stool and rope shop is selling things on the 16th. <laughs> but by all, by all likelihood that'll be the day I go up the stairs and jump. And the whole thing will fall around on top of me anyway. <laughs> um,